Um, so I'm going to be talking about experience design. I'm going to be talking about continuous delivery and how they kind of fit together in kind of ThoughtWorks view um, to the rest of what we really do. Um, so I talked a little bit, or Nick's talked a little bit about me. I'm kind of curious if I can do quick hands up. Folks in the audience who would kind of characterize themselves broadly on the technical or implementation side of the house. Hands up, please. Okay, that's a lot of hands. Um, people who would kind of say that they are more on the sort of business product owner side of the house. Okay, interesting. Probably, there's probably about 70, 30, 80, 20, something like that. Um, and, and folks who are explicitly either on um, the design side or in the sort of DevOps continuous delivery space. Got your hands up. Kind of much fewer. Okay, that's kind of interesting, because one of the things that I want to touch on really um, is some of the influence of our perspectives in terms of how we actually drive the most value out of the type of kind of process I'm going to talk about. Um, now, at this point, I was going to, because uh, you're such a senior audience, kind of apologize for the fact that I've actually got uh, photographs of post-its all the way through, but the ground has already been broken by, by Brian with, uh, uh, with the photographs of the, uh, of the card, so now I feel uh, that but like my thunder has been stolen. But, um, uh, <laughs> uh, but I did these all myself, so I'm very proud of that. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not going to define uh, continuous delivery more than has been expressed already. So far more eloquent folks than me have talked about um, continuous delivery. So hopefully by this stage in the day, you've got a, you've got a sense of what that component um, of, of the piece is about. Um, I am going to touch lightly on experience design and come to more detail um, later, if you like. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, if you like, actually, um, all the folks who sit under this label are really charged with, um, in my view, clearly communicating uh, either a kind of a process or a goal or how you achieve that uh, for a customer or a user. And yet, as a group, we've really struggled uh, with the label that we use, and we're terrible about using acronyms, and it's not very expressive. So XD is experience design. People who live under here actually come, uh, would describe themselves as interaction interface designers, user experience experts. There's a whole milieu of uh, names under here. But I think the key thing is the XD perspective is about primarily thinking about your user or your customer. And I'm going to use those interchangeably today. Um, Understanding what that individual is trying to achieve by using uh, the products or services that you're offering. And that could be out to the general public, that could be within your organization to your employees. Focusing on the goals they're trying to achieve, their highest value ones, and understanding how to make as engaging and as simple the process of the user achieving their goal. So for me, at the heart of it, that's what the experience design is about. What is it like? for your user to accomplish their high value goal. What is that experience like? Walking in their shoes and thinking from that perspective. We had a couple of very um, kind of good examples, albeit kind of lightweight, um, I thought earlier, when Mike was talking about some of the redesign that they've done on the, um, the, the .gov site there. Example of that information around you know, bank holidays, bank holidays. And actually saying, well, really, what was the primary goal in the user coming to this page? Was it to get a table of all uh, the bank holidays? Probably that was one of the goals that was there. But you know, their research said primarily it was to find out when the next bank holiday is. So there you go, right front and center, you've got that information. But you can't miss it, it's very big. And I didn't have time to look at it uh, as he popped it up. But I assume below that there would be a table that allows perhaps you know, the whatever it is, the 40% of other users who want to get that information to get that information. Likewise, in terms of that maternity pay entitlement uh, example, it's like understand what is the primary most high value goal of your user. Okay, so uh, the key thing here is we're talking about CD, uh, continuous delivery, we're talking about experience design and about connecting it with what for us in ThoughtWorks um, is business as usual, so BAU. Um, so this idea that um, for us, at least for about 10 years now, we have been developing software um, in a kind of an agile manner and learning the lessons from that. And we've got pretty good at predictable delivery of quality software. That kind of, that core is no longer the constraint. But we've touched on a number of things that um, increasingly are, which is it's all very well building this kind of high-powered delivery engine, but if you're loading it into your 
a performance car and driving in the wrong direction, then all you're doing is getting to the wrong place quicker. So continuous delivery allows us to take whatever we've created and get it in front of our users, but we also need that component generally Initially, it's upfront to determine what really is this product or service that we're offering, and is it validated? Is it the right thing to do? If you can connect all those pieces together, that's a really exciting place to be. Uh, I mentioned there the, this idea of kind of validation, validation of direction, validation of um, uh, learning, and um, in general, the way that we do that is um, as human beings, if we're kind of seeking feedback, we appeal to our senses and. There's something analogous, I think, in the context of you know, teams that are working on developing products and services um, and the way that they go about kind of uh, sensing whether they're doing the right thing. Because if you're going to build this kind of continuous feedback cycle, you need to have information to tell you which way to go, right? So this is meant to be kind of indicative, certainly not exhaustive, but to give you the type of feel of uh, the sources that the teams that we work uh, with use. So firstly, there's its team itself. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the role of the kind of product manager and how the product manager works um, with the rest of uh, the team. Um, but you have that kind of internal sense of direction and vision about your product and service. Um, SMEs, in this instance, subject matter experts. So yes, you're going to appeal to specific individuals who know a great deal potentially about your domain or have a particular perspective. You go out and you're going to look at the market and say, you know, what are my competition doing? Not only what are my competition doing, but actually what's happening generally in the space that my product or service is. Are there some ideas that might be currently applied to a different domain, to a different vertical, that I can apply to mine? Um, some small group analysis. So we've had mention already today of um, to taking ideas for products and services and testing them with small groups, whether that's initially with the type of focus group activity or as soon as you have something that's a little bit more tangible, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, um, putting it in front of users so they can actually interact with it. But small numbers, arguably not significantly, um, statistically significant, um, but enough that you begin to get uh, an indication of perhaps parts of your proposition that are very, very out of whack. So a lot of work done um, in the 90s by uh, Jakob Nielsen around the idea of guerrilla usability testing and the fact that actually with only five to six individuals going through your experience, you can drive out some really profound um, learnings about the basic journey that you're taking folks on. Why should you care? Why should you care about you know, establishing this kind of engine that's able to adapt based on this data that you're gathering from multiple sources. And apologies, I, re I realize I left out perhaps um, one of the most interesting uh, and most topical, and that's the, that's the analytical portion and what you can do um, as you, uh, in the digital space, instrument uh, measure what's happening on your product or service and how you can uh, kind of play that back in, and we'll, we'll come to that uh, in a moment. The benefit here is the ability to, to respond to your customers, to your market. So, um, one of Jim's themes um, in his previous presentations, Sam picked up on that, is the idea that um, you know, as a business, you at the macro level have a choice. Do you want to be efficient and do you want to be responsive? And Cindy took, talked very eloquently at the beginning of today about the kind of situation that's out there um, in terms of uh, the degree of churn and change that there is. So, to me, when you are looking at a kind of macro situation, a macroeconomic environment where we don't really know what tomorrow is going to bring, so that black swan situation, we can't appeal to precedent to know what's going to hap happen tomorrow. This idea of building your business to be highly responsive is, for my money, compelling, which is why I'm enthused about this. Um, okay. Um, well, that all sounds well and good, but stepping back for a second, I um, want to ask the question around um, how successful we are as organizations at unlocking the potential, actually even within ourselves. So part of the reason for asking the question about folks in the room, do you have a business perspective? Do you have an IT perspective? Is, you know, it's interesting. It has been quite a longstanding uh, truism, I guess, at the, at the team level that there's a disconnect between business 
and technology. And a lot of the practices and approaches of Agile are about breaking down those barriers um, and increasing the degree of communication. Um, my role affords me the opportunity to talk to an increasing number of senior individuals in organizations. And I made the naive assumption that you know, as you become more senior, perhaps in an IT structure, then clearly the business listened to what you have to say. You have influence over them. And at that level, at least, there's a good level of understanding and engagement and shared understanding. Well, my experience um, over the last uh, couple of years of talking to multiple senior execs is this is not generally the case. There is, amongst some of us, a sense that the IT portion of the delivery equation is perhaps treated as a bit of a second-class citizen, as a commodity, as not really having the right to come to the table with ideas and suggestions, which is kind of interesting because if you look out there at the moment at some of the most disruptive propositions in the marketplace, typical examples are your Flickers, are your Twitters, they seem to have emerged from a very, very close, respectful sharing relationship between people who have the idea and see the potential um, and people who have the ability to implement that technology. Um, and one of the questions that I would like, uh, I guess, to ask today is, you know, what are we as a group doing to ensure that we're unlocking that value and actually not running the risk um, of putting our businesses over the cliff. So if we have this capability accessible to us and we're not making use of it and our competition are, what does that mean and what can we do around that? So one of the things that was particularly interesting to me listening to, the, um, to Brian and Georg this morning is a really great counterexample there. So what we saw was um, business and IT apparently uh, I believe it's true, working very much in um, harmony. Um, and there's some interesting examples that we've seen from our clients where they have really reached out and engaged the delivery team um, in the ideation part of delivering the product or service. So to give you an example, um, with a couple of clients, we are doing work where um, at a certain frequency, uh, the team do innovation weeks. So what this means is the vast majority of the time, clearly, the team are working on functionality that has been determined by the product owner, and they're delivering that according to uh, priority. But at a given schedule, the team has the opportunity to go and spend a week or two weeks uh, investigating their own ideas. So they go off and implement functionality in the context of you know, the, the wider uh, application, and they bring that back, showcase in certain, uh, in certain cases the examples of that, and um, yeah, prizes awarded, uh, and they kind of they scored, and there's a winner, and first, second, and third place. And what we're seeing is these ideas that are coming from uh, the delivery team being taken in and actually put as part of the backlog for the overall product because you see a very interesting combination of the technologists seeing the opportunity that the technology can bring in terms of what's uh, cheap and yet compelling to do, um, and the business seeing that in a very tangible uh, working way through working software. So I think you know, a specific and very interesting um, example of how um, that uh, sharing and collaborative uh, relationship between Business IT at team and both senior levels is, is um, really, really important. Um, another instance where we've seen that be the case is um, actually an emerging trend amongst um, executives who are given the opportunity to um, carve out their role. So when they're going into a business and talking about, okay, what would you like the scope of your responsibility to be? Historically, that combination of um, technology director and, and product director are two roles that have been kept quite separate. Um, and yet now what we're seeing is um, people looking at how can we actually combine these two together? If there really is the synergy, and believe there is the synergy between these two things, how can we bring those roles together so that rather than having that natural break and antagonism, we actually create an environment where um, <laughs> so at some level that individual is you know, fighting with themselves. Um, but at least that kind of that tension is internalized and the direction out to the team is kind of clear 
uh, and is consistent. Okay. Um, so just to step back uh, a minute to that kind of overall framework, in the center we've got this agile delivery engine, this kind of predictable uh, ability to deliver software of high quality. Um, at the far end, we've got our continuous delivery capability, which means we, we're getting those ideas out in front of our customers. And at the front end of that, we've got our kind of experience uh, design team who are able to help um, the product manager, the business, articulate and iterate whatever the proposition is. So what do we need um, to kind of make this happen? So I want to talk about the kind of people and processes and, and tools that kind of underline this. Um, firstly, just to acknowledge that we have got that core team. Um, to a large extent, um, that is understood. Those roles are pretty well in understood in terms of the project manager, the developer, the QA, and the business analyst. Um, I've talked a reasonable amount about product manager. Um, and I'm going to pause on that, because I'm going to talk about more about that in a second. Um, it's interesting. Um, ThoughtWorks itself has been on a journey over the last um, 10 years or so in particular. I mentioned that I joined uh, as an interaction interface designer, and you know, my, people slot, uh, my people soft allocation was BA, because as an organization, we didn't know what that role was. We didn't have a place for it within our thinking. And that was pretty reflective of the agile community uh, as a whole. And what we found is as we have matured, and as I think um, the market has matured in terms of understanding what does it take to build a team that's capable of delivering compelling experiences, we've increasingly recognized that the experience design role and more latterly that DevOps role are critical to a team that's going to, um, that's going to pursue the type of uh, delivery situation that we've kind of described. So we now look at those roles as baked in to our teams. So whereas historically we'd have looked at the PM, the dev, the QA, VA, now when we look at how we would staff a delivery team, we always say, okay, and what about the experience design, and what about the DevOps component? And that evolution in our thinking is following through in terms of the model that we just talked through. Um, let's talk a little bit then about uh, product management. So, it's interesting. How, how, do we have any product managers in the room? So many folks did pop their hand up. Okay, one. That, I, I don't know if that's because this isn't the type of place to come if you're a product manager, or whether that's a reflection of just how, I think how tricky businesses are finding to come to terms with exactly um, what this role is. Um, and that's why we have the dotted guy on the left, because we find hmm, it's not uncommon for us to engage uh, with a client around a piece of work, um, which presumably has a business case, um, and somebody who is passionate about it happening, and we ask, okay, who cares whether this happens or not? Which individual has the vision for this product or service? Who is that final appeal to authority if we need to make a kind of a trade-off decision, if we need to make a prioritization? And it is not uncommon for the situation to be a fudge of some sorts. There may be somebody who gets given the title of product manager, but if you dig a little bit deeper, they're more a, uh, maybe a, a, a project manager or they might be more a marketing individual. Um, and our collective experience is this is a gotcha. It's a real challenge if you do not have a clear product owner. And the fact that, as I say, in our experience, we are not collectively very mature at ensuring that role is in place in a team, it's a, very, it's a, it's a real risk. At the other extreme, um, we do find scenarios where you have almost the project, uh, the, sorry, the product manager as God. So they are the infallible source of the truth. And um, what they intuit on behalf of the customer is the answer. So you are effectively uh, building the product for them. And um, if you like, in some ways, um, this is my Steve Jobs slider. So everybody says you have to mention Apple uh, in a presentation on uh, product and experience. Um, so the Steve Jobs slider uh, is meant to determine how, in your organization, how much towards that view of um, product management you are. So typically, um, Steve Jobs wasn't big on uh, testing or gathering data because clearly 
his customers didn't know what they wanted until he showed them what they wanted. Um, in a similar manner, um, I don't know if it's apocryphal, but uh, you know, the Henry Ford quote, which says, you know, if I'd asked people what they wanted, then uh, they would have said faster horses. Um, so clearly, at one end of the extreme, there is a view that you know, the way to be successful is to find that product manager, that visionary with the big idea. Okay, that's the right end of the scale, if you like. Towards the left end is really abdicating responsibility. Um, now, in a good situation, maybe that's abdicating responsibility because you're handing that over to just you know to data, to some form of information coming in to help you prioritize one thing over another, and we'll speak a little bit more about that. Um, at the worst case, it's that it's just it's open warfare amongst the team in terms of whose opinion gets in there, and sometimes it's higher just paid opinion wins. Well, as with everything, I guess the truth is probably. Uh, somewhere in the middle. So certainly, you need a product manager who has got vision. Um, they have got to resolve, they've got to facilitate the resolution of the different streams of information that we've talked about coming into the team. So um, Marty Kagan, who wrote a book called um, Inspired, How to Create uh, Products Your Customers Love, describes the product manager as somebody who assesses the product opportunity and defines that product, um, the product to be built. And then he, he goes on, though, to say, you know, one key to this is for each of you, and he's talking there about these different perspectives, if you like, the, the product manager representing the business, but the implementation team, the engineers, the guys creating this. Um, one key to this is for each of you to understand that you are peers, neither subordinate to the other. And the other interesting thing that he repeatedly talks about is that um, you, this, uh, this process is a process of discovery. Um, Jim used, uh, in his uh, grid, talking about adaptive leadership, had exploration over planning. This theme of you're not sitting there um, trying to reveal the perfect product or the perfect solution, and if only you had right now that intuition, it would be sitting there. Rather, you're going on an iterative journey, and you are collectively, with your team, with those wider sources of data, discovering it, co-creating it as you go. Um, so just, come, just to come back to those kind of sources of information. So what is that kind of product manager sitting there, service manager sitting there, kind of synthesizing, facilitating? Again, it's the team. Um, it's the market, it's the subject matter experts, it's the small group, but let's talk a little bit more about um, uh, the analytics space, this, this kind of large group, the, this, the behavioral aspect here. The capability that we have increasingly with online propositions of actually tracking um, uh, people's behavior. There's an anecdotal story about a focus group that was carried out around um, you know, MP3 players. Um, so a company invested a bunch of money, had a focus group, asked people to come in, um, and they were trying to test whether people liked you know, bright primary colors um, on their devices. And so they sat down and they, they showed some you know, uh, slides and some, some mock-ups and asked people. And people were like, yeah, you know, I, I like the ultramarine. I like the, uh, I like the, the shocking pink or whatever the descriptions were. Um, and they kind of duly gathered all that data. And then on the way out, there were a number of uh, buckets, you know, each with a different color of MP3 player, and as you know, part of the thank you for coming along, you could, you could take one of these devices as you left. And what they did was they compared what people said in the context of the focus group with what people actually did when they left. And they found that predominantly people took the silver and the, and the black. Um, what they said they would do is actually they liked the primary colors. So you know, it, all of this is about triangulating data from multiple points to actually try and understand um, your kind of customer. Um, so there's some really si exciting things um, that this makes possible in the kind of analytics space. I just want to talk through a little example that was actually shared in, in um, last month's issue of Wired. And what they looked at there was some work that was done on the um, Obama campaign. And this was about trying to get people to, to sign up to the campaign in the US. Um, uh, you know, ultimately to gain kind of donations. And they, um, they A-B tested. So they, they 
they put on the sites different versions of the same experience and they looked at the behavior, rather like looking at which thing you take when you walk out of the focus group. And for example, on the sign up page, they had three different buttons. One said learn more, one said join us now, and one said sign up now. And they found through looking at the data that actually, I should probably do this. <laughs> Which one, okay, hands up if you would press learn more. Okay, hands up if you would press join us now. Hands up if you would uh, press sign up now. And that's actually exactly what they found. They found that the overwhelming um, number of individuals would uh, press learn more. So that's the design that they went with. Then they had um, an image um, on the site. Now, the team had decided that a video of uh, Obama at a campaign rally, presumably gesticulating and, and uh, being very rhetorical, would be the thing that would compel people to sign up. Um, so they put the video on. Um, and then somebody said, well, I, I think most of us will be familiar with that kind of iconic, I think it's turquoise and, and red image of, uh, of, of Obama that was the kind of campaign poster. And they swapped, they said, well, let's swap that video out, it's quite draining on bandwidth. Um, let's put that in and see, see what happens. 30% uptick. They said, okay, well, why don't, we, why don't we try one version with an image of Obama with his family? Another percentage increase. Overall, the adaptations that they made based on this data, it, by their calculations, increased the sign-up rate by 70%. Now, they did some maths and they said, okay, if you look at that, that's 13 million email addresses we wouldn't have got otherwise and $75 million of campaign contribution we wouldn't have had, all because we changed three things based on uh, you know, data from actual behavior on the website. Fascinating, and not rocket science, right? And the other thing is, some of that completely contradicted the intuition of, um, you know, of the folks who were the gurus in this case, so who thought that kind of rhetorical gesturing um, campaign video would be the one to entice folks in. Um, very, very interesting. So uh, we kind of get into a world where if you're in that position, you can make a series of, as you can see, you know, change the button text, change the label, change the tiny changes at low risk with a real sense of kind of predictability and confidence that the changes that you are making are the right ones. What do most of us do currently? Well, we kind of sit in that towards that Steve Jobs end of the system, is that we, we look for somebody who's really confident that what they're saying might be the right answer, and we place a bet on that. I, I certainly have. I suspect many of us have worked with, uh, in organizations where very senior individuals have placed uh, bets of actually many millions around these type of decisions. The type of stuff that we're talking about here changes, changes the game. Um, you know, one, one interesting thing here is um, uh, in the article it says, okay, well, take this to its logical conclusion, okay? So we've, we've talked about continuous delivery, and in the context of continuous delivery, it's technically possible for a developer to check in to commit code at one end of the process, and provided the tests all pass, for that uh, piece of software, that deployable binary, to pass all the way down the process and go live. Now, most business owners, most product managers get a little bit twitchy about that from you know, check-in to live in front of customers without anyone touching it. Some organizations are there. Um, but what they want to do is, uh, I guess, you know, kind of kick the tires on it. They want to have confidence. One of the things that's potentially possible here is why do you need the product manager, right? So you select a number of alternatives. You plug those into the site. It runs the numbers, and whichever of the three or four choices the team came up with through whatever data sourcing they, they did, that's the one that wins. The data does the design. Not the product manager, the data does the design. So again, you, know, you can think about where we can go with the continuous deployment, right? We can go away with product managers. You just need to come up with ideas, and we'll let the crowd source. So I guess that's the other end of the Steve slider, is you just let the, um, you just let the data decide. But Clearly, I mean, that is an extreme, and it, it's a danger because you end up with, that's fine for a, maybe a button choice, but you, you need a wider vision for the overall um, experience. But it's an interesting kind of thought exper uh, experiment. So Brian Christie, who wrote this particular article, says, you know, many now look with pity on the offline world. The testable web is so much safer. So um, 
you know, I wonder how many of you feel uh, that, uh, you know, the online space and that kind of product manager is a safe place to be or a risky place to be. But it's interesting to know that there are folks out there with that um, kind of particular um, perspective. Okay. Um, well, you know, we, we, we've talked a lot about this kind of feedback loop, this kind of continuous design, continuous delivery, test and refine um, process. And I guess it kind of begs the question, what are these things that we're actually iterating? So what are we evolving? Um, and, you know, I guess there's, there's a number of answers to that. Today, I'm going to be speaking, we focused um, mainly on the experience and on that process of taking the software that embodies that experience and deploying it to live. But clearly, there are other things um, that are moving in concert with that. You've got the underlying code base that you're deploying that delivers the experience. And one thing we haven't really touched on at all is the actual business model. So the type of process that we're talking about here gives you the opportunity to gain insight across all of those. Again, these are indicative, not meant to be exhaustive. Talking, at least I'm going to talk you know, more about the experience and the deployment. Okay, let's come back then to, to this, this, um, this experience, this uh, user journey um, that we are, uh, if you like, iterating at the heart of this feedback-driven um, cycle. So, you know, what do we mean by that? So again, coming back to that kind of brief introduction around experience design, you know, at the end of the day, uh, for the technology side of the room, we spend a huge amount of emotion and energy and passion um, delivering um, what, from the user's perspective, is sometimes quite a minimal experience. If you think about, you know, booking a hotel or searching Google, search Google, you tap something into a box, you hit search, and you get a bunch of results. What is complicated about that? That's a very, very simple experience, right? Now, the technical complexities of the algorithms that are running uh, to sort out your search and give you the most relevant results, these aren't really of interest to the user. They are, insofar that they'll come back or they won't come back by the perceived quality of the return, but the mechanics, they don't care about. And I think um, one of the things that uh, has been, uh, is important in the agile world is this expanding of the recognition of what we need to care about as we are working through this cycle. So um, at the very simplest level, we've got our user here. We use techniques like you know, personas to understand our highest priority users, what their view of the world is, what they care about. What are they trying to achieve? What is the simplest process to get there? At the end of the day, for this user, most often, all the back-end hard work is three or four screens, and hopefully a successful outcome at the end of it. We want to make that experience as simple, as engaging, often as brief as possible. So for us, uh, when we're working to try and understand this, kind of in the heart of that process, it's about you know, how can we model things that we can get feedback on to know if we're going in the right direction or not. So um, I'm, I'm guessing that many of you use personas, use tools like empathy maps, use process modeling to understand the highest value journeys that your users are going on, and at some point, and probably quite quickly, get to a position where you can st start to mock up the type of experience a user might have. Again, think back to uh, the examples that um, Mike popped up. Very, very simple to model that basic experience. You could do it in half an hour, less, with some post-its and a Sharpie, the felt tip for those of you who don't know. Yeah. Do it very, very quickly and get feedback from a user around whether that is uh, useful to them. Validate the learning using the cheapest, simplest possible mechanism available to you. So um, for those of you who are perhaps more familiar with um, Agile and the Agile Manifesto, um, last year, I think um, I'll look at Jim, Kent Beck made a change, or he adjusted or added to one of the principles, placing validated learning over working software. And I think one of the reasons for doing that was a recognition that um, sometimes creating working software to get that level of feedback isn't necessary. You can use a simpler, cheaper, more rapid uh, approach, and you can learn more quickly from it. And that means that you are failing even faster than you would have been uh, doing otherwise. So simple techniques, mapping processes, running folks through that, realizing those processes as user journeys, showing the type of information, the number of steps, 
what's available to folks, allows you to gain that um, extra validity in terms of the feedback. Early steps until you can actually get something up and online. And again, if you think back to the example of asking people based on um, you know, what do you think of these colors versus their actual behavior, if you get it to a stage where people are exhibiting, exhibiting actual behavior, that's far more valuable. So, get it out there. Um, that brings us on to the question, I guess, of how soon can you get it out there and what are you getting out there? So clearly, in terms of getting feedback, the sooner you are putting something in front of users that's recognizable um, and works, the better the feedback that you're going to receive. Um, Jim showed us uh, his kind of revised version of the triangle. At the top, he put value. And in parentheses around that, he said, you know, releasable product. This is a real challenge for many of us because um, everybody wants the whole kahuna. How many of us have been in those kind of traditional waterfall release discussions where the product owner, the business, wants everything in this release because it's a bus that only comes very rarely. So if the bus is in, you want to make the full advantage and you want to pack as many people, as many features as you possibly can onto that bus. The upshot is it takes longer. It takes longer to get it in front of your customers and it takes longer for you to get that feedback. Um, so there is a real challenge to us as teams, as uh, product owners, if we want to make the best of this continuous design, continuous delivery cycle to keep those units small. Again, we looked at and saw in the Springer example that we have got uh, a release on a weekly basis, 20 releases in 23 weeks. Um, I think, again, the Verivox guys said, um, actually, what we ended up doing is, even though the business weren't demanding it, we were putting stuff out on a Wednesday. So we were releasing on a weekly basis so that we can get that kind of feedback. And that actually is an interesting point because um, what we're seeing is the constraint in the process moving. So historically, and again, Brian alluded to this, we're no longer able to blame IT. Historically, IT were the constraint in the process. It wasn't the product manager, it wasn't the folks coming up with the ideas evolving that because they could easily keep pace um, with our ability to get stuff out into market. Interestingly, if we're fighting the good fight around keeping it at just enough, that changes the dynamic. Now, actually, the challenge is with the business analysts and with the product owners to make the decisions quick enough. And it's a very interesting kind of turnaround, I think. Um, certainly, um, you know, for, for us as ThoughtWorks, um, usually being on that kind of implementation side of things. Okay, so um, just in terms of wrapping up a little bit around tools and techniques. So, you know, underlying this is a bunch of discipline. We've talked mostly today on the technical side around um, continuous delivery, and we've alluded to the tools that sit under there. You know, Go is one example of a continuous delivery tool that can help you create that build pipeline. Um, that stuff in BAU, that stuff in the core, continuous integration, version control, TDD, automated testing, all the rest of the practices remain absolutely core. I, we haven't talked much about them today because we're almost taking that for granted. Um, and it's really important, this level of discipline. If you are going to create, uh, again, I interesting, I think it was, the, it was Brian from Springer who described that kind of XD, BAU, CD as a, as a kind of engine for innovation. If you're going to create that engine for innovation, it comes at the price of a, of a high degree of discipline. Why? Well, all that discipline under the covers on the technical side, that is what manages your cost of change curve. So again, those of you who may be familiar with Agile long time, we used to talk about this a lot. We, we do it less so now, but it remains absolutely at the heart of what we do. You're able to make these changes and feel confident to make these changes because the cost is managed for you in terms of what does it cost me to make this change in the code base at a very basic level. With the automation and the discipline um, now extending out to continuous delivery, that cost is kept very, very low. Arguably, the reason why people like to do the requirements gathering as much as they could up front traditionally was because if you changed your mind later, it was extremely expensive uh, to actually put that through into production. So by managing that cost of change, that discipline flows through to all the rest of the benefits. But in all the glitter of the other stuff, it's important not to forget that these are the underpinnings of why we're able to do that. Um, you know, as I mentioned, kind of extending beyond that kind of core, um, 
this ability to kind of complete the last mile, I think reliably, uh, repeatably, and at very, very low risk, key component. So you know, um, none of this stuff is easy. Um, there isn't any uh, secret sauce. It's hard. It's hard because of the, the discipline that's required around the technical pieces. Interestingly, you know, one of the things that I've been arguing today is that it, it's hard, actually, because of some of the organizational structures that we create. Again, as businesses in the large, as IT functions, um, as business owners, are you making the best use of your team? Are you unlocking the value in there? Or are you hobbling yourself? Are you uh, a business, not maybe you individually, that is at the Steve Jobs end of the kind of product manager and, and kind of visionary scale? Because if you are, I hope that you really do have a Steve Jobs because as far as we can see, there aren't many of those guys about. So the percentage game is probably you're not there. Well, if you aren't there, what are you using to guide how you evolve your products and services? We talked about at least these five sources of data that can really help determine and direct um, the way that you take your product or service that can make, as the quote said, it's almost, it's almost safe being in an online digital environment, particularly on the web. You get to a safe position. All of that comes with cost, with discipline around the technology, uh, with a willingness to challenge internally. Um, so we just kind of in summary, the w what we're seeing is the thinking, certainly from a ThoughtWorks perspective, that started in that core, that heart of delivery, um, so that ability to predictably, reliably deliver quality software has extended in two ways that make a much more compelling and exciting proposition. Through continuous delivery, allowing us to take whatever we created in that uh, business as usual and get it in front of customers and users rapidly. At the other end, this sense that this engine is in a car that's heading in the right direction. So this engagement, this engagement with product management, sourcing data to validate learning, hugely important in terms of making sure we're going in the right direction. All of that culminating in ability to, to be responsive. So yeah, just in closing, you know, okay, you're not driving the car off the cliff today, but are you doing everything that you can to maximize what you already have in your organization and the data that's available beyond that? If you are an IT leader, to what extent are you challenging the business about a right to sit at that table, about a right to contribute to you know, the product and the services that you're delivering? Again, whether that is externally to the marketplace or internally. Because our experience, um, the example of the Innovation Weeks is a good one, is that um, you know, both portions of the team have a heck of a lot to contribute. If you're a business leader, you know, where are you on that Steve uh, Jobs scale? Is it highest paid opinion in the room? Is it that you have somebody who has this you know, just intuitive insight into the customers? Or do you need to ratchet that back? So I will leave you with that question. Thank you.